Our guest today helped to create 44,000 jobs for women in a Middle Eastern country. Reem Assad from Saudi Arabia. Ms. Assad, I mean, when I hear that, 44,000 jobs, I mean, my gosh, we need you here in the United States creating jobs. First of all, thank you for having me today. It's such a pleasure to be in this beautiful city. Um, I don't know if the number, the exact number is 44,000, but uh, we are about six years after the uh, campaigning and the law that came into effect. And ever since that date, women have been joining the workforce in increasing numbers. Uh, so I think it's well beyond 44,000 jobs. I think the, official, the statistics that came out uh, said that it was well beyond 44,000 during the first two years or three years. But we're in the sixth year, sixth year on, so I, I believe that the number is larger. And there's uh, much more interest uh, in, in, in women joining the workforce by different social factions. Now, are you a politician? I'm not. Do you uh, own a great big, huge, massive company that's uh, like an oil company or something? I wish I did, but no. I am uh, a financial advisor in a financial institution, one of the largest financial institutions in the kingdom. And I have been working in finance since 2001. And since that time, I mean, I was coming into an industry that was largely male-dominated. And I had a few other women who uh, joined me into positions that are not traditional to women, such as managing women's branches. Of course, um, you might know that the different, uh, I mean, different sectors where women work tend to be not co-ed, so women and men are physically segregated. Mm -hmm. Now, when I entered um, the banking industry, I was one of the few women who took a job where men and women are not exactly separated physically. So I worked alongside men. I received um, much mentorship and uh, uh, cooperation by my male colleagues. So in that sense, I must admit, I was very lucky. And uh, since that date, a lot has changed. I mean, that particular financial institution where I worked had hired very, very few women in co-ed positions. Uh, Here since in the United States, we would call you a trailblazer. Well, <laughs> in a way, let me tell you that much. That very financial institution today has a female CFO. Oh, my gosh. And that, I mean, I was completely... I was pleasantly surprised when I heard that and I had to double check the news over and over because she is a young uh, a person full of energy and uh, knowledge and they handed her this huge responsibility. I want to, we want to know a lot more about you but before we do I've got to ask this question and, and that's about getting the 44,000 plus right. jobs. Uh, social media was a, a big part of the campaign wasn't it? Uh, that's right, and let me let me just give a quick background. What happened is that the, re the retail sector, where um, women are largely consumers in Saudi Arabia, is dominated again by uh, male staff, uh, male owners, male managers, and the entire industry is male dominated. So traditionally, men sold everything from car tires to lingerie. Men sold lingerie. Yes, they, they were basically staff in all shops, in general malls and in, in boutiques where people frequented to buy and purchase items. Now, So women walked into the lingerie shop and spoke with ordered, the Ordered, spoke or just picked up the items and just went away. The majority of women didn't feel comfortable interacting with male staff, which is normal. Yeah. And because I deemed this to be completely out of... Um, it didn't make sense. It was not appropriate, but aside from that, it did not make sense. And there were a lot of women in need of jobs. So one evening, I got triggered by um, some kind of behavior by a male staff member, and I decided that, no, this is not how it should continue to be. But then there was the obstacle of who should I complain to? Um, I didn't know who I could talk to, and that's why I started using social media, the game changer in Saudi Arabia and much of the Arab world. 
was, I mean, were people ready to jump on your side, uh, you know, and, and support you on social social media, but perhaps in the regular press they may not? Well, I just put a post on my Facebook page saying that something happened tonight and this is not acceptable and it does not have, to, we don't have to put up with that. Three members supported, uh, three of my friends on Facebook supported the cause, but there was no cause. There was nothing really. I was just posting a complaint. And then that complaint developed into an idea. The idea was to exert some pressure on the retail industry by boycotting the shops that, are, that were run and staffed by male members. You know, forgive me, but we're talking about Saudi Arabia. And here in the West, we look at Saudi Arabia as a country that's pretty controlled or controlling. Is that right? Controlled or controlling by who? Um, uh, by mostly men. Well, traditionally, women stayed at home, uh, raised the children, cooked the food, took care of the domestic affairs, and the men went out, worked, and brought dinner to the table in the evening. So this is the very, very traditional society. Now what's happening is that all this is changing. The family dynamics is changing. The home economics are shifting in, in, in a different direction. The way women and men approach life, earning, uh, planning, and retirement is also changing thanks to more women joining the workforce and the progressiveness of both men and women. I mean... And change agents such as yourself. Change agents like myself, like the younger folks over at schools and colleges who are watching their moms going out to work every day. We cannot discount... Uh, the power of the younger generation. And we can't discount the power of education. Let's talk a little bit about you. I understand that uh, you've got a bachelor's degree and an MBA as well. Correct. The bachelor's degree was that? In chemistry. In chemistry. In, in natural sciences. You blow up physical things. science. I, that's what they well, say that, we that's, do. <laughs> that's, you know, when I was in high school, you know, if you took chemistry class, you got to blow up things. So we were all really brilliant. We, we did have our, have our share. <laughs> I, I graduated and there were not enough jobs for women in that domain except being a teacher, a high school teacher. Oh. And I was not about to um, go um, and make that choice. I simply did not want to. Um, so I changed careers. I went on to uh, get a degree in uh, finance, MBA focused on finance. Mm -hmm. And luckily, when I returned to Saudi, I, w I went to school in Boston. So when I came back to Saudi, I found a job pretty quickly. Those were good days for our employment. And I was even more lucky to get hired by the largest financial institution in the kingdom. So I was well paid. And I understood the power of women, financial independence. It why meant did, so much. Why did they hire you? Why did the, the bank? take a chance on hiring a woman uh, in a, a very non-traditional job for Role. a woman. Yeah. Well, there is a story to that. The, the bank went on hiring MBA, Saudi MBAs, MBA holders who had just graduated with degrees from the United States. It was a very specific program. Mm. And I happened to be the only female in, a pro, in the first batch of six gentlemen, all of whom are my friends until this day. And um, we progressed. Some people left the banking industry altogether. Some people stuck around like myself. And during that journey, I completely understood and appreciated the power of economic and financial independence. That, I mean, I cannot speak enough about it. And then down you're, the- You're married though, right? I am married with children, three children, three girls. So I have no choice but to make that place a better place for my daughters. Um, I did work hard to raise financial awareness and financial independence for both women and men, but my focus was mainly on women because they had less knowledge and less understanding of how managing own, one's own finances are. Did you find that women wanted this kind of knowledge? Absolutely. I receive requests every day by email, on social media, on different platforms, asking how can we do this, how can we do that. And the nicer part is that it's contagious because even high school kids come up to me saying that we heard about you from our moms and we thought we do have some savings and we want you to help us grow it. 
So, so are you kind of like a star in Saudi Arabia now? I don't want to call, I don't want to have titles. I'm just happy doing what I'm doing. Well, let's talk about the lingerie campaign. Yeah. I understand that that's actually not really correct, but it was the West that dubbed it lingerie campaign? It was dubbed lingerie, I believe, because that's the, that was the starting point. Um, the campaign was very focused and very targeting, targeted on the, on the lingerie shops because that was the start. That was a priority. But then the scope of the campaign and the scope of uh, opportunities expanded beyond lingerie stores. It extended to clothing, um, toys, shoes, leatherwear, and so on. So it was it was pretty it was pretty comprehensive. And today, all makeup stores and, and makeup shops across the kingdom are managed and ran by women. Oh, before it was men. Before it was men, everything was was staffed, all the stores across the retail industry were staffed by men. Now that has changed and so did the lives of dozens of thousands of women. Wow. What was, I, I guess when, when there's that much change culturally um, where women are taking jobs where they didn't before, were the men upset that women were taking their jobs? Initially, some men felt threatened that they would be displaced, but let me mention something that a lot of people may not know. The majority of the retail jobs were um, performed by non-Saudi expats. So what happened is the displacement um, shifted the expat presence from inside the country and had women join the workforce instead, rightfully. So there is more money circulating within the economy rather than uh, transferred back to, their, to different countries, to other countries. And to a large extent, that's the same kind of attitude that seems to be here in the United States today, where there's an attempt by the new administration to, to bring back the bring, jobs and bring, bring back, back the money and the capital and so on. So that was, that was good in that sense. There's more purchasing power, there's more earning power, and there's more disposable income, all of which are very important in, 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 in you know, composing a, a healthy economy. You know, what I'm hearing you say is, in talking about Saudi women, that to a large extent, they're in a place where American and Western women were a few years ago. Um, a few decades ago, perhaps? Maybe decades, yeah. <laughs> decades ago. Um, but that, that's okay. It, it is that you're changing. And, it, it, and it you're, is. Are you changing by choice or are you changing by force? I think both ways. By choice, in the, in the sense that a lot of women are sensing uh, the freedom and the liberty in making um, better living and having more choices and more capability in life. By force is that life is getting more expensive, like it is pretty much everywhere, mm -hmm. and the model of a single income provider per family is no longer sustainable. Even in Saudi Arabia? Even in Saudi. Saudi is just another country where the population is is witnessing um, economic changes mm -hmm. and... What's well, expensive there in, in comparison to the United States? Uh, Saudi Arabia is not an expensive country to live. Uh, we do not pay uh, income, individual income taxes or, you know, um, there are corporate taxes, but on the individual's uh, personal income, it is tax-free, so and the gasoline is very, very cheap. Still, the power, the water is all well subsidized by the government uh, up to this point. Now, that will change. And that also, that anticipated change also prompted a lot of families, men and women, to seek jobs. So, let me give you an example. Years ago, what I would apply when, if I spotted an ad, uh, a job ad, I would like call up and they'd say, sorry, not for women. Today, they would ask, what's your degree? What are your qualifications? So it's a survival of the fittest today. That is a dramatic change. Before we started the interview, we were talking about you, you have high school students come up and, and they're asking you questions as well. And so if a, a high school girl were to come up to you today and say, you know, how do I make it in the Saudi economy? What right. would you tell them? 
Well, I tell her that you first you need to be able to have a, a, a personal income statement or uh, a net worth statement. So I ask her first by, do you know what you're worth? She goes like, um, no, but I managed to save some money. I said, well, that counts towards your personal uh, net worth statement. I teach them how to create a monthly balance sheet, a budget sheet. I, I, I try to provide them, and it, this is available on the website, on our website, and um, the stuff that I put on social media. Mm -hmm. The basic templates on which everybody uh, needs to look and, and to try to, you know, train themselves to fill out comfortably. Um, I try to let people understand how to read the numbers, what the implications of the headlines, the, the, the economic headlines are. And, and it's, it's. You know, when you figure that out, would you let us know over here, too? <laughs> <laughs> because it changes every day. I know. Almost it, every minute. It does like. change every day. And there are a lot of things that are literally inexplicable. But. Um, generally speaking, I, I start with the simple stuff, uh, the common sense, the business common sense, and I let the conversation start. So people read and they learn just a little bit, then they start asking questions, and then they create a dialogue. Has there been a change since, since this uh, employment is being created? Has there been a change in the way men and women interact in Saudi Arabia? Well, interact on a public level or on a family level. There has been a change. Well, women are becoming bolder because they need to get out and actually interact. They need to start talking to, to men everywhere to get by, to take public transport, to pay their bills, to do this and do that. So this is normal public life. It was much more limited in the past. Today, it's much more open. On a family level, and everyone who was uh, a, a partner would know that. The dynamics of the family change. The communication between both partners would change depending on who's doing what. I mean, the typical role play in the family where women knew and was expected to do something as opposing to her male counterpart, that has changed. They're both now bringing money at the end of the month. They need to share, they need to split, and take the responsibility for the family together. Uh, so the stereotypes are being shattered slowly and in its place coming um, a more dynamic interaction between both men and, women, men, men and women. It is no longer strange for children to see their mom dressing up, preparing breakfast, and getting ready themselves to take them to school and then off heading to work. So that is a socioeconomic change that, I mean, is more of a cultural change in the heads of the newer generation. Mm -hmm. Now what that means, if, if we just think about this for a second, that means that in the future, the conflict and the resistance to women working will no longer be there. Because the boys in the family already grew up seeing their moms working. So I think, I think the ball is rolling and things will just get easier in the future. Now, here in the United States, uh, women have been strong for quite some time, whether or not you say that they've had to be or not. Sounds like I'm hearing there's a lot of strong women in Saudi Arabia as well. You've been in education here, I mean, you've been educated here in the United States. You have grown up uh, in the Middle East. Is there a difference uh, between Middle Eastern women and Western women? Well, as the time passes, I just realize that there's so much convergence. We aspire for pretty much the same things. I mean, I ask women around me, what is it that you look forward to? I mean, 10 years, 15 years down the line. Many women who are uh, middle-aged, perhaps, or in their 30s, they look forward to a comfortable retirement, a safety net. If you ask that same question to a woman 20 years ago, 15 years ago, she'd probably say, I want to see my kids getting married, grown up, happy, happily perhaps settled and all that. Today, the dreams themselves have changed. Women realize that they want to have this financial security. And I don't know how, I, how to put this, but frankly speaking, they are sensing the importance of, of independence. Now, ideally, she would be in, in, in a marital relationship with her kids and 
perhaps grandchildren and all that. That's an ideal um, common dream for all women. But the financial factor is increasingly becoming something that most women are dream dreaming about and are thinking about and are concerned about. And that they want, they want to take uh, their affairs in their own hand. That so I noticed. Money is power. Of course, of course it is. I got to ask this question. Um, here in the West, we look at Middle Eastern women and we see restricted dress. Right. And when we see that, we think that the woman doesn't have her power over herself. Right. Is that right? Well, let me surprise you by saying that a lot of women choose that dress code. I don't choose to wear that, either home or here. But, and, and I know a lot of uh, women like myself who choose not to conform to that particular dress code, at least outside the country. Mm -hmm. Back home, we all have to, you know, go by, you know, follow the social code. But I do agree that some dress code back home is pretty restrictive physically as well as perhaps emotionally. Uh, a lot of it isn't, so even that is changing. So it's shifting from black to colorful. It's shifting from, uh, I mean, head cover to less headgear. Uh, it's shifting from face cover to non-face cover and so on. Again, I must repeat, this is largely a personal choice and a lot of women choose to do that. Now, the West tends to automatically assume that this is a male imposition, but in 80% of the cases, it's not. Tell us about a day in the life of Reem Assad. I wish there would come the day where I don't have to get up so early every day. <laughs> well, okay, I get up around 5 o'clock, I um, read, I see what I need to do. I, I write down, normally I write down, or I take notes of what I need to do till the rest of the day. I check out my calendar, I say my morning prayers, and I start, you know, working on my girls' breakfast dressing up for school, dressing them up for school, and I usually like to take them myself to school, so we take our private car and chauffeur um, to school, and then off he drops me to office, and I'm a nine to fiver, so I work till five. I come back home, luckily I have help, so dinner is ready, homework, supervision, perhaps some disciplining, and by nine, my system gradually shuts down. Man, I'm just, so. I'm worn out just listening right now. <laughs> it sounds yeah, like the stressed out life of uh, just about Well, I get, I get a weekend of break every week. I get a couple of days of, of a break. But you're also traveling internationally and speaking. You are, and, and so I, I read an interview with you from a couple of years ago, and the question, it was a great question. Uh, are you a revolutionary, or are you just a banker? I'm a nonconformist. I, I like to challenge the status quo. I like to ask questions. But over time, I learned that some, sometimes we really need to let go of things and to prioritize. The one thing I learned uh, from this journey is that you need to focus on one thing at a time. I mean, we could, we could set out to do various activities at, at some point all together. But when it comes to change and becoming an, a change agent, you need to focus on one endeavor at a time and give it your best. And I think this is one of the reasons the campaign has succeeded. I mean, a lot of women saying that we need to, we need to get women out there to drive, we need uh, freedom, we need this, we need that. Well, that's fine. I chose to focus on one thing that was within my knowledge, uh, something that I understood very well women in the workforce and financial independence and I think again the, con the concentration and the, fo the focused nature of the campaign helped uh, make it a success really in a country where campaigning was literally non non-existent. Causing that much change though are there some people who don't like you? I'm not quite sure, but I have to admit that I faced very little resistance during ca the campaign time. Why do you think that was? Do you think that the, the country was just ready, the people were just ready for some, some changes? 
That I mean, was... Old people don't give up power easy. Yeah, that was a factor, but I was facing off with the retail industry. So these were, um, this was the rich, the filthy rich private sector. They oh, had the a lot of money. Oh, yes, okay. it is controlled by uh, the private sector and certain private institutions, mm -hmm. and they had lots and lots of money and a lot of power and connections to the policymakers. So it was not as simple, it was a bit convoluted and not straightforward to understand. But I had to take it one step at a time and we applied social pressure. I had people demand that change. And luckily enough, one of my mentors educated me that there is a law in existence that has not been implemented stating that only women could be recruited in such stores. The law was completely defied and not followed and not put into effect thanks to the power of the private sector lobby. So we did some digging and we said, I mean, I said in the campaign that I'm trying to bring that law back to life and, and get it properly implemented. So that was one thing that I would not have known had it not been for my mentor who previously campaigned for the same cause five or six years earlier, and it was much harder. Hmm. Uh, you do have men who are supporting you. Absolutely, well. absolutely. Within my family, outside the family, my parents are my biggest supporters, my husband. And you have men helped. who are supporting the cause. And I mean. men who are supporting the cause within the media, writers, um, second degree lawmakers, people who are very well connected with the policy makers. So, frankly speaking, um, I think the biggest part was getting the society on board. I had to literally go out and make my voice heard. And the media... You, how did you do that? I mean, here, we would use the media to do that. I use social media. You use social media. That's different. I use social media, and the, the, the mainstream press and media picked that up. Oh, they did? They did. They didn't see it as uh, something that might conflict with their own interests because you were going around them. I don't think it was. They picked up the story and it really spread so fast in the mainstream media, local media as well as the foreign press. Now, both, uh, both um, teams or both ends helped a lot. I mean, there was pressure, but more so there was spreading the knowledge that there is an issue, we're trying to get it fixed, and who's on board? Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me.